Um, Dr. Joe Franklin earned his BA in psychology at Wake Forest University, which let me tell you is a great psych program to graduate from because I also did. So we have that in common. Um, and he um, went to graduate school at UNC Chapel Hill and he um, has been very prolific in winning fellowships and awards since then. He did a postdoctoral fellowship at Harvard with Dr. Nock and um, in 2015 started in the clinical science program um, as an assistant professor at uh, Vanderbilt University. Uh, he's gonna tell us about some of his very interesting work with smartphone apps and uh, suicide detection and prevention today. It's really fascinating um, when we talk about assessment, when we talk about how do we identify the people that are mo most risk. He's really gonna touch on something that we haven't done as much yet in research or in clinical work with. So I know people are trickling in, um, so please come in, have a seat, and um, I will turn the mic over to Dr. Franklin. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, and it's awesome to be there here. Again, my name's Joe, and today I'm gonna to be talking about how some recent radical changes in research have substantially advanced suicide risk detection and prevention just over the last year or so. So first, why do we even need to try to make these radical changes in our approach? Well, a big reason is actually this red line right here. And this red line represents the U.S. suicide rate over about the last 35 years. Um, so as you've heard before, and in this New York Times article, it has increased a bit recently, but really since the year 2000, close to 25%. And actually, if you extend this out to the year 1900, it's a fairly flat line where it's pretty close to, to 10 or so all the way back since we've really been keeping records. So, this actually stands in stark contrast over these 35 years to the major reductions that we've been able to see in things like deaths due to motor vehicle fatalities and deaths due to homicide. So to me, this is absolutely unacceptable because I think, as many of you think, that all of these suicide deaths are actually preventable. And it's not just suicide deaths. So the rates of suicide ideation, plans and non-fatal suicide attempts show a similar stagnant pattern, if not a slight increase in recent decades. And this is despite increases in treatment usage by individuals reporting these issues over the same time period. So as researchers and clinicians, we should all be outraged by this graph and the one that was on the, the preceding slide. And that's because they demonstrate that whatever we've been doing over the last 50 years or so in suicide research, it just really simply hasn't been effective for the things that we're most charged to, to take care of. So today I'm gonna to be talking to you about how um, myself and some of my colleagues have really been trying to change the trajectories of these types of graphs. I'm gonna start by briefly summarizing the entire history of suicide risk detection efforts through about the year 2014. And as a basic preview, through about the year 2014, our ability to predict suicidal thoughts and behaviors was essentially on par with random guessing. So second, I'm gonna talk about how um, my colleagues and I, along with some other groups, have made some recent advances beyond this state of affairs. And finally, I'll end by talking about some recent app-based treatments that we've been testing in a few different randomized controlled trials. So to start with risk detection, I'm gonna be describing, it's called a meta-analysis, where we just put a bunch of studies together um, that my team and I conducted over the last couple of years that tested all risk factors for suicidal thoughts and behaviors over a 50-year period. And I wanna bring your attention here in this title to a very important yet often misunderstood phrase, which is risk factor. So risk factors are obviously absolutely key to understanding suicidal behaviors, but just like in many other fields, we're often very much inconsistent with how we use the term risk factor. So sometimes whenever we use risk factor, we actually mean concomitant or a correlate of something. Sometimes we actually use it to mean a causal risk factor, and sometimes we really do use it to mean risk factor. But these three things are not the same thing because a correlate is associated with a given outcome, but directionality is going to be unclear. This is where you have a lot of cross-sectional or retrospective type designs. 
A risk factor will precede an outcome and divide people into low and high risk groups. And this is where longitudinal designs become really, really important. And causal risk factors, um, changes in causal risk factors will cause changes in levels of future risk. But again, just like in many other fields, in the suicide field, we've often confused these terms um, whenever we've been trying to describe things in our papers, whenever we've been trying to develop lists of warning signs and risk factors, and whenever we've been developing our theories and treatments. But this distinction has huge practical implications for our field because correlates turn out to be poor predictors and poor treatment targets. Risk factors are generally going to be good predictors, but they may not be great treatment targets. And causal risk factors are often good for both prediction and treatment. So it's critical that we distinguish between these things even when we see some extremely strong and enticing correlations both in your day-to-day -day life and clinical work and even in research. For example, over the last several years, this has been the pattern of US suicide deaths by suffocation and hanging. Over this same time period, another factor has shown nearly the exact same pattern. Are there any guesses as to what this other factor might be? Close, it's the number of lawyers in North Carolina. Um, <laughs> But good guess. Um, but it's not just North Carolina. We see the same pattern for the number of lawyers in California. And before we start making theories about lawyers and, and suicidal behaviors, um, over the last several years, US suicide deaths have been powerfully correlated with things like the cost of bananas, <laughs> average money per household spent on pets, and my personal favorite is per capita consumption of chicken. So all of these correlations are much, much stronger than what we would typically see in our own research whenever we run our studies. But it's probably safe to assume that no one's gonna be proposing a theory related to suicide in chickens or bananas anytime soon, or at least I would hope not. I wouldn't necessarily be all that surprised. Um, <laughs> so, um, but generally, this is because correlates just aren't gonna be that helpful for helping us understand suicide. They can sometimes be very helpful as a first step to see if something is generally associated, but it should just be that first step. We need to go far beyond that to figure out what among the correlates are actually risk factors. So again, this highlights how important it is for us to distinguish between these three types of associations. And again, unfortunately, in our field, there just aren't very many studies of causal risk factors, so we don't have much information at all about that kind of association. Um, so what our meta-analysis primarily um, focused on was trying to disentangle correlates from risk factors. In particular, we really, really wanted to know if there were actually any significant risk factors that existed at all, and if so, how strong these risk factors might be. So we hear a lot about these things from clinical practice, we hear a lot about these things from guidelines, and we see them from individual papers, but whenever you put the entire literature together, what really comes out? What is really a risk factor for suicidal thoughts or behaviors? So for the next few minutes, I'm gonna be talking about, for this particular meta-analytic project, some of the assumptions that we carried going in to this project. Then I'll give you a brief overview of the methods and some of the basic descriptive findings. And then I'll describe some actual analytical results and then I'll talk about a few implications of these findings. So first, again, to our assumptions. Now, based on the plethora of risk factor and warning signs guidelines out there, we assumed going into this project a couple of years ago that we had some very solid knowledge about risk factors. We might not be perfect, but we had a pretty good idea of who was going to be at risk and who wasn't. We also assumed that because science should be progressive, that since this whole field of research and suicide prediction started about 50 years ago, that our risk factor knowledge and ability to predict future suicidal thoughts and behaviors must have been steadily improving over time. And we were almost 100% certain that things like prior suicidal behavior, hopelessness, depression, impulsivity, things like that, were gonna come out as being very powerful risk factors. Now, in terms of our methods, uh, to keep this part of it uh, short, basically what we wound up with after a lot of searching were 365 papers that qualified for the meta-analysis. All of these had to be longitudinal, 
and all of them had to use some kind of factor, at least one, to try and predict future suicidal thoughts behaviors. So from these 365 papers, we wound up with over 4,000 of what we've termed prediction cases, and I'll describe a little bit more about what that means here in a moment. Um, but we were able to convert 82% of these into a common metric called an odds ratio, which I'll explain a little bit more a couple slides from now. And the other 18% were hazard ratios, which I won't go into today, but the results that I'll be presenting on the odds ratios were nearly identical to what we had found for hazard ratios. Um, so I just mentioned um, prediction cases, and what do I actually mean by this? Well, for a given study, a single study may look at three different risk factors. So something like smoking and depression and impulsivity, and it may look at this across two different types of outcomes, suicide attempts and suicide death. And so each one of those represents a separate prediction case, a separate attempt to use some kind of factor to predict um, a future suicide-related outcome. So on average, each study contained about um, 11 or 12 prediction cases that we coded for. So again, within our entire meta-analysis, what we meta-analyzed really were those 4,000 prediction cases. All right, so for the next few slides, what I really want to do is start just by presenting some basic descriptive findings from this project that I thought were, were pretty interesting. And one of the first things that we noticed, it might not be that surprising, is that the number of papers in this area, suicide prediction, has increased almost exponentially over the last several decades. So really, over the last 10 years, more studies have been conducted on this than were conducted in all of history before then. And every year, the number of papers on this topic goes up um, almost by half. So as you might expect, we see the same pattern for those prediction cases. Now, another thing that we looked at were follow-up links. And we're actually kind of surprised here because the majority of studies actually looked at suicide, um, tried to predict suicide over extremely long intervals. As you can see here, many, many of the studies actually had follow-up links that were more than 10 years, um, many more than five years, and comparatively few were even a year or less. In fact, less than 1% of the studies actually included follow-up intervals of one month or less. And to us, this was kind of disappointing and a little bit surprising because as clinicians, what you're often charged with trying to figure out is who's going to be at risk over the next few hours, days, or weeks. Not quite as much who's going to be at risk over the next uh, 10 years or, or 20 years. It's very interesting to know that, to understand that, but I think that this should probably be flipped where most of our research is on the very short intervals with a little bit of research on the very long intervals. All right, so for outcome types, um, just to give you an idea for what the outcomes look like in this particular literature, about 15 or so percent of studies included suicidal ideation as an outcome, and then the number that included attempts and, and death um, were, were much more. And relatively few looked at things like uh, plans and, and NSSI, although I will say that those are, are increasing in frequency, particularly the non-suicidal self-injury research areas is growing pretty quickly. All right, so in terms of risk factors, so the kinds of things that people were using as predictors in all of these studies, what really struck us was the extreme homogeneity here. So there were four broad categories that accounted for nearly 70% of all risk factor types that anyone's ever tried to study. And these were things related to internalizing psychopathology and externalizing and prior self-injurious thoughts and behaviors and demographic factors. So the majority of anything anyone's tried to predict with falls into one of these four categories. And adding another four categories brings us to 95% of anything anyone's ever looked at. Um, admittedly, these are fairly broad categories, but out of the near infinite things that we could use to try and predict and understand suicidal behaviors, um, it's really come down to just these few basic things. All right, so in terms of our analytical results, Again, our, one of our major questions here was, like, are we actually any good at all at predicting suicide ideation attempts and death? And to try and figure this out, we use something called an odds ratio. And I know some of you are familiar with this and some of you might not be, so I want to try to give a brief primer on this over the next couple of minutes. Um, so basically, an odds ratio is just a ratio, and it's a ratio of the odds of something happening in one group 
compared to the odds of something happening in another group. So for example, the odds of um, someone dying by suicide, they've been diagnosed with depression, compared to the odds of them dying by suicide if they have not been diagnosed with depression. So let's say that we run this study and we get an odds ratio of two, indicating that people who had been diagnosed with depression were twice as likely or had twice as high odds dying by suicide as people who did not. So that might be statistically significant. It might be interesting to say there's a 100% you know, increase uh, among people who are depressed. But is that actually good and meaningful in a clinical sense? Can you actually use that? Will that actually influence your day-to-day -day practice? Um, well, to try to figure out what it actually would mean in a practical sense, we can just do a little bit of math. And so according to the CDC in 2013, about uh, 40,600 Americans died by suicide, but around 314 million Americans did not. So overall, in America in 2013, your odds of dying by suicide were 0 .000129, so almost zero. Now if we assume that depression doubles those odds, then you move to 0 .000258. Um, so still essentially zero. So no, at least practically and day to day and when you're working with people, an odds ratio of two isn't that helpful. It raises the odds of dying by suicide from basically zero up to, again, basically zero. So one way to think about this is actually, at least I like to think about it, in terms of lottery tickets. So let's say that you have 100 lottery tickets and I just have one. Well, your relative odds are amazing. You are 100 times more likely to win the lottery than I am, but you are still not gonna win the lottery. Um, <laughs> probably. Uh, so, so your absolute odds are near zero. Um, so the odds aren't quite as small um, for dying by suicide, certainly not as small for attempting suicide or having suicide ideation. But um, as was mentioned this morning, the, the base rates are, are pretty low. So whenever we're thinking about this in a more global sense, it's important to, to keep that in mind. Um, so what I'm about to show you in terms of the results, what we're really looking for for something that would be super meaningful you, for you on a day-to-day -day basis would be some odds ratios in the hundreds or at least in the tens, um, that kind of thing. So to this question, in order to answer it, you're gonna be seeing a couple of graphs like this where on the y-axis, these are just weighted odds ratios which Long story short, it's just putting all of the odds ratios from those thousands of cases all together and weighting them um, essentially based on uh, sample size. And this line right here will represent chance level prediction. So an odds ratio of one equals chance level prediction because it means the odds in both groups are the same. And the error bars here will represent 95% confidence intervals. And the tighter they are, the more confident we are about whatever uh, level of prediction that we're getting. So what did the results actually look like? Well, um, the odds weren't in the hundreds or tens or anything at all like that. So overall, whenever you put everything together, you get stuff that's basically right at chance level. So right now, putting everything together, our ability to predict suicide, ideation, attempts, and death are pretty close to an odds ratio of one, whatever you count for publication bias, because stronger studies tend to get uh, published, then it moves much closer to just you know, pretty much chance levels. So, no, we are, we are not good, uh, not, not at all. Um, I don't have much time to discuss it today, but we also examine these findings in terms of something called diagnostic accuracy rather than just odds ratios. So the results here show that uh, what's called areas under the curve had an almost chance level somewhere, um, you know, 0 0.54, 0 0.57. To give you a little bit of an idea of what that means, um, basically, areas under the curve, or AUC, are going to vary from 0.5, meaning absolutely random guessing about something, to 1.0, meaning absolute perfect prediction about something. And typically, in research, you're going to fall somewhere in between there. Um, obviously, our, our goals, not just in this kind of science, but in uh, medical science more generally, are to get as close to 1.0 as you can. But right now, at least when putting everything together, our ability, after 50 years of research, to predict suicidal thoughts and behaviors is essentially still at random guessing. All right, so we looked at a lot of moderators of this to see if any possible variables might explain why prediction is so poor overall. You know, maybe 
And these kinds of studies, it was really good, and those, it was really terrible, and that explains it. Um, but we didn't find that anything was a significant moderator, meaning that if anything, uh, longer studies actually got you a slightly worse prediction. Um, the more severe your sample was, the um, poor you tend to predict as well. It didn't really matter how many people you had in your study, from you know, 20 or 30 to a few thousand, um, the results were about the same. And it didn't matter if you're working with adolescents or adults or the elderly or some mix thereof. You're just getting the same results across the board. So on the heels of these extremely disappointing findings, we were just very curious as to whether our risk factor knowledge had actually improved at all over the last 50 years. And I, for one, was really certain that it had, in part because the number of studies has increased dramatically over the last 50 years. Um, so you would expect, again, if science is progressive, that you would see something that at least vaguely approximates this kind of linear increase. So what do the results actually look like over time in terms of prediction? Well, starting with ideation, where the first prediction of ideation study was in 1991, uh, weren't that good to start, and we've actually gotten significantly worse since. For suicide attempts, uh, not that great to start either, and you know, worse pretty much leveled off uh, the last 30 years. And suicide death prediction was never good, um, still not good. Um, so for my colleagues and I, this was pretty shocking. Um, some of us have been in the field for a, a while and wouldn't have expected this kind of result. Some of us have been in the field for a while and would have expected this kind of result. Um, but it's still, it's still disappointing to, to see. I think a lot of other fields would actually find the same thing if they did similar analyses. But for us, this really showed that our risk factor knowledge, at least in terms of accuracy of prediction overall, hadn't improved since this era. So from 1965 through, through 1984. And that was really concerning because almost all the studies have been conducted after that time period, which really you know, starts to question, what do we learn from those studies? What was the necessity of those studies? And what can we do moving forward not to repeat this again? So that was extremely disappointing for us. Um, but these findings were focused on overall predictions, so pushing everything together. We thought, Doing that could be a little bit unfair because maybe there are some really amazing predictors that are out there that are just really getting washed out by putting everything together. So we're very, very confident that there were a few specific predictors that would come out as being very strong. And we were absolutely wrong. Um, so predicting suicide ideation, so this is the hundreds of potential predictors that were, that were out there. I'm just gonna show you the top three for each outcome. So the best predictor, according to the meta-analysis, putting all the studies together of suicide ideation is prior suicide ideation, followed by hopelessness, followed by a diagnosis of depression. But none of these odds ratios, again, are, are super high, and they start to you know, trail off pretty quickly, even by the third, third best one. Um, we see something pretty similar for the best predictors out of, again, all possible diagnoses, anything anyone's ever used to predict um, for suicide attempt. Um, as was mentioned earlier, non-suicidal self-injury actually came out as the strongest predictor, um, followed by suicide attempt and uh, screening instruments that, that people have used. But again, you start to see it trail off pretty quickly after the first one, uh, really, and these aren't in the tens or the, the hundreds. And for suicide death, um, the best predictor of future suicide death is not prior suicide attempt, um, as is stated in, in many, many different places, is actually um, having any kind of history of prior psychiatric hospitalization. And we haven't done the studies to know to the degree to which it's iatrogenic, but our thinking right now is it's, it's probably a really good marker for people that are, have a lot going on or going through a tough time and maybe have made a, a prior attempt. Um, but for whatever reason, um, prior psychiatric hospitalization seems to be a relatively strong predictor. But I want to emphasize here that these should not be viewed as a list of extremely important risk factors that you should keep track of and you know, to the exclusion of others um, whenever you're working with people. And this is because these are only the best risk factors relative to a bunch of other extremely weak risk factors. In an absolute sense, they're still just not very good, especially whenever you're thinking about the base rates of suicide, death, and, and attempt. Um, so another way of putting this is that this is kind of like how I was the best player on my fourth big grade basketball team, <laughs> in my mom's opinion, anyway. Um, so 
but I was only the best relative to a bunch of other extremely unathletic fourth graders. Uh, in an absolute sense, I was and still am absolutely terrible at basketball. Um, and so based on existing research right now, what I'm saying is that all of our individual risk factors are essentially really unathletic fourth graders. Um, and this includes things like prior self-injurious thoughts and behaviors, depression and hopelessness, things that we classically um, think about. Individually, at least as they've been studied so far, um, they're just not going to be that helpful for us. And a major reason for all of these very disappointing findings and um, how things have been over the last 50 years really, we believe, is, comes down to our, our methods. And one issue here is that we've been testing the same risk factors over and over again for the last 50 years. So what I'm about to show you is a list of the top five most commonly studied risk factors across each era or epoch of, of suicide research. So demographics has always been one of the most commonly studied. Internalized symptoms, followed by social factors, prior self-injurious thoughts and behaviors, and externalizing symptoms. These five have always been the top five. And they've always accounted for somewhere between 74 and 80% of all risk factors that people have looked at. Um, so, and looking at it like that, it shouldn't really be that surprising that we haven't gotten much better because we've been testing the same risk factors over and over and getting the same results. And this has been wonderful for scientific replication, but not great for, for scientific progress. Um, so a second problem that, in my opinion, might even be a, a much larger problem is that we've had some really homogenous and somewhat unfortunate study designs. So almost all of the studies that we looked at, I'd say 99%, looked at um, suicide predictors as isolated trait-like phenomena and then had an average follow-up of about 10 years. So based on our meta-analysis, what we know right now is that nothing's a really good predictor within this kind of design, but we don't really know much about what predicts well outside of that kind of design. And it's also worth noting that this kind of design doesn't really look like anyone's suicide theory. There are very few theories out there saying there's one thing that never really changes and over the course of 10 years, it's gonna have this effect. Instead, uh, most suicide researchers and, and even clinicians would say it probably works a little bit more like this. It's pretty complicated. So you have several distal risk factors. Some of them are traits, some of them are more state, um, and several proximal risk factors. Again, some of them are traits, some of these are, are state. This could be five things, three things, 100 things, uh, 1,000 things, and they combine together you know, magically and over the course of a few hours, days, you know, perhaps weeks, they increase risk a bit. Again, sort of echoing what was talked about this morning. Um, this can change, you know, moment to moment. Um, but virtually no studies have tested this kind of model, which is the most common way that most of us might think about how suicide works. Um, so again, we haven't really been testing most of our theories very well, and we haven't been providing much useful information for clinicians. So what conclusions can we draw from this? Well, first, I really want to spell out what we believe these findings do and do not mean, because it can be very easy to misinterpret. And I'll start with what they don't mean, and that's that this doesn't mean that our risk factor lists are useless. It doesn't mean that traditional risk factors play no role in suicidal behaviors. It doesn't mean that we should just give up on risk factors or prediction, and likewise, it it doesn't mean that we should just focus exclusively on treatment or perspectives that would completely eschew risk factors or looking for risk factors. What it does mean is that we should recognize more formally that our risk factor and warning signs list are mostly rationally derived rather than empirically based, that we pretty much have no idea what specific role um, a lot of these factors play in suicidal behaviors. And this is really because our methods just haven't been capable of telling us much about these risk factors. So our findings show that we really need a lot more research on risk factors, not less, with the major caveat that this research will have virtually no value. It'll just be a continuation of the patterns I showed you before, unless much more sensible research methods are employed. And I want to say here that really what we need to be looking for are risk algorithms rather than risk factors per se. And I'll say more about this a couple slides from now. So to summarize here, after this massive meta-analytic project, in my view, this shows three hard truths about the suicide prediction field um, currently. Uh, 
That's first that our ability to predict suicide really is currently on par with random guessing for the most part. And second, at least with suicide prediction, we haven't really been a progressive science. We've been more or less doing the same studies over and over and over again. And third, it seems like we've kind of forgotten what our, our problem really is. And by that, I mean most of us have been looking at suicide as what could be called a simple classification problem, meaning that almost all studies have, again, taken this one factor and tried to use it to accurately predict suicidal thoughts and behaviors. But I don't think that that's going to happen, and I would guess that many of you wouldn't as well, because suicide might be best conceptualized as what's called a, a complex classification problem. And this brings me to the second part of the talk, which um, for the next few minutes I'll describe how conceptualizing suicide as more of a complex classification type problem has already led to some major advances in the accuracy and scalability of suicide risk detection. So uh, to start, what do I even mean by complex classification problem? Well, we encounter these classification problems every day. You've already s solved hundreds and hundreds of them today, and you don't even know it. Um, and we solve these with algorithms, which is just a fancy word for a set of rules or, or operations. So algorithms can range from being very, very complex um, to, to very, very simple. So an example of a very simple um, classification problem would basically be classifying dots as uh, blue or, or pink. It just requires one factor, color. Pretty simple. Now, uh, a little bit more difficult one, kind of an intermediate classification problem, is where you need to start considering a lot of factors all at once, and generally not just simple relationships between them, but it can get more complex. For example, trying to determine who should and should not receive a loan is more of an intermediate type classification problem. You're going to want to consider 10 or 20 or 30 factors all at once and some complex relationships between them. But classification problems can get a lot more complicated than this. For example, internet search queries are highly complex classification problems. So there are about 1 billion active websites and several billion active web, web pages. Being able to identify what a given user wants based on just a few words that they type in is an extremely difficult task. But to accomplish this, search engines like Google construct these algorithms to integrate hundreds of unique factors at the same time. For example, the Google algorithm itself um, uses over 200 factors. So just typing those few words in goes through a lot of things. So again, that's a very complex classification problem. And I would argue that the prediction of suicidal behavior is at least this complex. However, almost all existing um, suicide prediction studies have treated it much more like a simple classification problem. Again, almost always using one, sometimes a few factors at the same time to try and predict suicidal behaviors. So a corollary of this position, again, is that instead of focusing exclusively on risk factors or what the best risk factor might be, we should probably start prioritizing the development of highly accurate risk algorithms. Now, one problem here, though, is that the traditional statistical techniques used in psychology just aren't well suited to model very, very complex uh, classification problems. In contrast, something called machine learning is optimally suited to do so. And so it's a little bit beyond the scope of my talk today to give you a full primer on what machine learning really is and how it works and all the many advantages of it. But even though you may not realize it, you're all very, very familiar with machine learning. So machine learning underlies the algorithms that control your spam filters, for example. It's what shows you the relevant ads online whenever you're searching things on Google or whenever you're on Facebook. It's what recommends the correct products to you on Amazon. And it's what corrects your typing whenever you mess up while texting. There are thousands and thousands more examples of this. Basically, almost all of your life is inundated with machine learning type stuff. Um, it's a subtype of artificial intelligence. But for our purposes today, I just really want you to know that there are three basic advantages for using machine learning um, type techniques for this area of research um, over traditional techniques. The first is that these techniques will learn the optimal algorithm for us. We don't have to come up with a convoluted theory with hundreds of different factors and figure out how they work together. It figures that out for us. Second, it can accommodate a very, very large number of potential predictors and extremely complex relationships among those predictors. And third, machine learning is really designed with big data and generalizability in mind. In short, this is how myself, my colleagues, and a few other groups really think that we should start predicting suicide and understanding suicide. 
and use of machine learning in psychology has really only started to emerge, but in the field of suicide research, there's already been one um, really, really interesting and promising study. This was led by Kessler and colleagues, published last year in JAMA Psychiatry. And basically, they developed an algorithm that gave us a, an AUC of 0.85. Um, you can't see that with the, the MAC transition, but they had an AUC of 0.85 um, to predict suicide death among soldiers. And so again, going back to our AUC scale here, um, this actually gets us more in line with what we'd call good prediction. And again, remember that this is a major advance because what I described earlier is that we've been working with AUCs closer to, to 0.56. So the Kessler study really is a, a major advance relative to all of that. So um, there are some issues with that particular study though that um, give us a lot of opportunity to improve upon. First, that particular algorithm was developed in a fairly unique sample, army soldiers who are typically more young and male. Second, it included several army specific type factors like age of enlistment. And third, it only included 68 suicide deaths, which is actually a fairly high number um, for our field, but it's still a pretty small number from which to generalize from. And um, fourth, the authors didn't report confidence intervals and, and similar things, so it's hard to know just how robust their particular estimate was. And all of these things potentially compromise the generalizability and applicability of this particular algorithm. So my colleagues and I um, tried to set out to advance beyond these kind of limitations. And we did this by applying machine learning to a large regional healthcare system. It was called the BioView. And this database includes over two and a half million patient participants with full electronic health records. Roughly 1,000 are added each week. And the goal of this project was really to, to develop a highly accurate suicide risk algorithm that was both clinically useful and widely generalizable. And so our sample um, for this particular study was about 3,000 patients, about 273 of which were suicide decedents and the rest were um, age and sex match controls. And we applied three machine learning techniques to our data. Um, something called lasso, random forest, and something called support vector machine, or SVM. And it's again, it's beyond the scope of this talk to describe exactly how these work and, and why they're interesting and important, but there are two major things that I really want you to know um, about this. And first is that each one of these algorithms, for what I'm about to show you, included somewhere between 100 and 355 factors all integrated at the same time. So instead of using one risk factor um, to try and predict suicide, we in included hundreds. And a another thing is that these are all very different types of algorithms. So if we start to get similar findings across them all, then that really gives us more confidence that what we found is something that's real and robust and not just an artifact of a an interesting method. So in terms of our results, we first applied um, support vector machine to this and got an AUC of 0.91. Um, which is, um, to be honest, something that we were pretty floored by. And to make sure that this was a reliable estimate, we went ahead and checked out the confidence intervals for that, which were pretty tightly wound around that. And we also ran the, the other two models. And as you can see, highly consistent, all with AUCs in the 90s. And for a visual representation of that, um, this is something called an ROC curve, where this line right here would represent chance level prediction with an AUC of 0.50 and up here is where you get perfect prediction. And we're closer to the 1.0 than we are to the, the 0.5, which is, which is great. Um, and so all of these were performing extremely well. It tells us that we can really do a great job of discriminating who's gonna go on to die by suicide versus who isn't. And because these models um, basically use the, the hospital, age and sex match hospital um, patients as control, um, the idea here is that applying this algorithm to anyone walking to the hospital should work just as well. So within the AUC scale, this moved us more toward excellent prediction, which I honestly didn't think that we'd really ever get to in, in our field, um, but we're excited to have some initial work on that. But the results that I just described compared suicide decedents to patient hospital controls, um, which is good, uh, but it's not the most stringent comparison you could make. And so much more relevant for many of you is what would happen if we tried to do the same thing, try to distinguish suicide decedents from people with a history of suicide ideation and behavior. Um, could we do that just as well? And so we tried that. We reran everything and we had a control group of 
about 70,000 or 17,000 um, people with some history of suicide ideation or behavior. And the results were essentially just as good. Um, so all AUCs in the 90s, they were actually slightly better in some ways. Um, and this is the ROC curve depiction of that. And something I haven't really mentioned uh, so far because it gets too much into the statistics of it, but we also included a lot of aspects of these techniques that guarded against something called overfitting. And basically, by going through all of these other steps and using these techniques, it means that these algorithms are um, quite robust. It means it should generalize to any new sample, any new group, any new person walking into the hospital. Um, so it wasn't just, let's make something that predicts well for this particular study and these particular people. It's something that, let's make something that you know, more generally um, could actually have a, a larger impact beyond the study. Um, so this is really, to us, was a, a very critical step toward developing a tool that could very accurately predict um, suicide um, risk on a large scale. And the next thing you're probably wondering is, what factors in these algorithms actually matter? And before I answer that question, I want to caution, this is kind of like asking what brush strokes are most important within the context of a painting. And so if I showed you this, it wouldn't really mean that much in isolation, but it's critically important in the context of something like Van Gogh's A Starry Night. So basically what I want to convey is that the individual factors within these algorithms um, don't really mean a whole lot whenever you look at them independent of the entire context from which they were developed. However, a few general types of effects did tend to emerge across all the models. One was um, being poor. There were several different indices of this. Another was having a lot of physical health problems, especially related to um, obesity and, and heart issues. Um, another certainly were mental health issues, particularly mood and substance abuse. And another were um, famously known uh, problematic hospitalization patterns, like frequent ER visits and relatively infrequent outpatient visits. Um, I also want to note something that we found quite important, um, sort of echoing what was said earlier um, again, which is that most of the decedents in our sample actually didn't have anything in their history explicitly about suicidality. Um, most were never flagged as needing any kind of suicide risk assessment. So to us, this really illustrated that um, how our traditional suicide risk detection system works um, means that it doesn't even really come into contact with a lot of those who are actually truly at high risk. Um, so the end goal of this kind of research is to be able to stratify risk in real time by applying risk algorithms in clinical practice. For example, um, we're developing an app that can immediately tell you a person's general risk based on the um, electronic health record. And this could be updated in real time based on new information that the patient gives you. And we're working on ways to integrate this into a large hospitalization, uh, hospital systems right now. We think that eventually this could help us detect um, millions of people at high risk who otherwise would have gone totally undetected. And as I round out um, this part of my talk today, I want to briefly illustrate how this approach could be revolutionary for the scale of suicide detection research. So normally it would take thousands and thousands of people to assess one million patients for suicide risk. Um, it takes us about one person and one hour to do that. And instead of costing millions and you know, millions and millions of dollars to do that, we can do it for essentially free because it's just an algorithm that runs through large medical databases. Um, and the accuracy, instead of again being more or less chance levels, is actually um, pretty accurate, especially for um, suicidal thoughts and behaviors. Um, so this moves me to the final part of my talk today, where I want to talk about a new app-based treatment that my colleagues and I developed. And I'll start by briefly talking about how we developed it and why, and then I'll end uh, pretty quickly with the results. So based on some of my prior laboratory work, we know that most of us really hate pictures like this. Um, and this is a, actually a relatively mild picture compared to some of the other ones that we have in our studies, but I'm betting that most of you aren't huge fans of this particular picture. Um, but a lot of people who engage in non-suicidal self-injury, especially if they've done it very frequently and recently, actually really don't mind these, and some of these actually rate this as being very pleasant. And the more that they tend to like these pictures, um, we found that the more likely they are to engage in future self-injurious thoughts and behaviors. So I wondered if it was possible to develop some kind of intervention that targeted this particular factor, which you can think of as kind of an analog to Thomas Joyner's suicidal capability. And I wanted to know if doing this would actually end up reducing NSSI or non-suicidal self-injury. So to test this, I recruited um, several people with a history of NSSI and sent 33 of them through an aversive conditioning procedure and 25 of them through a control procedure that I'll call random conditioning. So basically, the aversive conditioning procedure involved um, presenting these um, 
participants with an NSSI-related picture immediately as it goes off the screen, um, shocking them and repeating this 18 times within the context of several stimuli for which there was no contingency. Again, the idea here is to try to reestablish a negative association with those sorts of stimuli. The random conditioning procedure was um, essentially the same. We just had no um, contingencies associated with any of the pictures. And so, did this actually have an effect on NSSI rates over the ensuing six months? Uh, yes. So the group that went through the aversive conditioning procedure um, did show a significantly larger drop in NSSI over that same time period. Um, so although this was a very interesting proof of concept type study, um, it's not really a great solution because shock therapy isn't palatable. It's, it's not something that, I, uh, that we set out to develop or that was the, the point of this particular study. Um, and this intervention just isn't scalable. It's not gonna have an impact on national or international rates of self-injury. So we, re we really needed to find a way to put this basic concept into an intervention that was scalable. And that's when we came up with something that we call therapeutic evaluative conditioning, or TEC. So to understand what this is, it's helpful to be familiar with evaluative conditioning. Basically, it's just a form of Pavlovian conditioning that involves an extra evaluation component, meaning that it leads you to like or dislike something a bit more. And for example, if um, this blue triangle repeatedly paired with this image, you would start to like the blue triangle a little bit more over time. And this kind of pairing, you would start to dislike the green circle a little bit more over time. This doesn't just work with neutral stimuli. Um, for example, I really hate vegetables. <laughs> it's true. And you might too if these are repeatedly paired. So, welcome to my nightmare. Um, so now to the therapeutic part of this. Uh, what I just showed you were targets and unconditioned stimuli. You're welcome again. Um, so to make this therapeutic, um, you just have to change the, the targets. So based on many of our studies, we had two main targets um, for TEC. We wanted basically people to have more positive associations with the self and more negative associations with suicide, death, and self-injury stimuli. So that's what TEC is basically designed to do. So how does the app actually work? Well, it's web-based, so it's accessible from any particular device. It's very game-like. It's extremely brief, just takes a couple minutes, designed for people to, to play this hundreds or thousands of times um, on their own. And it gets a little bit more challenging as the trials go on. So at the start of each game, you're given three pairs of stimuli. The whole point is to match um, one of those pairs as accurately as possible in a given trial. The faster and more accurately you do this, the more points that you receive. So about those three pairs, one is, again, always designed to increase more negative associations with uh, self-injury, suicide, and death. One is always there to establish a more positive association with the self, and one's always going to be neutral with neutral to increase variety and difficulty. Now, these are the three pair types, and they're the same across each game, but the specific stimuli within the types um, changes randomly across each game. So an actual trial of TEC will look something like this, just a grid of stimuli. And so if these were the three pairs that you were given at the start of a particular game, um, then you would try to click on these as quickly as possible for that trial, these for this trial, and so forth, until you got about 15 trials in, where things got a little bit more difficult, where after you select the first member of the pair, the rest become masked. And the idea here is to increase the depth of processing, to increase the strength of that association change. And then it moves to a larger grid, and then for the last 15 trials, most difficult of all, with a larger grid with a masking effect. Um, and so, over the past year, my team and I conducted three randomized controlled trials to test the effectiveness of this on non-suicidal and suicidal self-injury. Inclusion criteria for the first two studies were two or more self-cutting episodes um, over the last month. For the last one, it was uh, suicidal behavior in the last year. Um, our ends tended to get larger as the um, different studies that we ran. Um, even though the first two studies didn't specifically select for a history of suicidal behavior, still most of the participants in the study did have a history of that and obviously everyone in study three. Uh, Follow-up rates were um, pretty good uh, for this area, um, but I wanna note that the results were essentially the same whenever we used something called multiple imputation to make up for anyone that ended up dropping out. The primary outcomes were always the same with self-cutting, suicide plans, and suicidal behaviors. And participants were randomly assigned to receive either the active version of the intervention, which is what I've just been describing for the last few minutes with those same pairings, or a control version, which is the exact same, except for it just includes neutral stimuli. So we started um, at baseline by assessing participants for, with the self-injurious thoughts and behaviors interview, and then we assessed our treatment targets with an implicit version of something uh, called the affect misattribution procedure. 
And I want to note that everything presenting today is actually after accounting for uh, several major covariates. So we followed people for one month and then measured them on everything again. And during this entire month, they were allowed to play TEC as often or as little as, as they would like. And in this way, it was much more of an effectiveness type trial. We really started running these initial studies just to see if anyone would even do this. Um, but I will note that um, even though these are more group-based effects, that the more that people played, the, the stronger the effects tended to be. So what effects did this type of intervention actually have on our primary outcomes? Well, here on the y-axis, um, we have the percent reduction of behaviors in the active group, so our treatment group, compared to the control group. And in study one, we saw a, a pretty nice significant reduction in self-cutting behaviors, pretty nice significant reduction in suicide plans and suicidal behaviors. And actually, to be honest, these were far, far larger effects than what we were expecting, which made us think we did something wrong or this was a huge fluke. Um, so we immediately just ran another study that was as close to that study as, as we could make it. And sure enough, the effects were a bit weaker with the effect on plans being non-significant, but they were still in the same directions. There still um, appeared to be something there. And just to see if study one was too optimistic or study two was too pessimistic, we ran that third study. And it looks like the truth is probably somewhere in between, um, where this does seem to have um, a, a real nice um, effect. Um, although I'll note that this was just during the treatment month. For the month after that, a lot of these effects tended to go away. And so you tended to need to be playing this in order for it to have um, its therapeutic effects. And I'll also note that um, there were only about 30 or so suicidal behaviors in each one of these studies, and that made us a bit nervous about interpreting those effects. So one of the things that we did is decide to combine those across studies. We wind up with 91 total suicidal behaviors. And then whenever you look at those across groups, um, obviously it wasn't an equal distribution because we have a treatment effect. Um, 74 in the control group and 17 in the active group during the course of, of that month across all three studies. So what we have so far, I think, is extremely promising, but I want to emphasize that these are just the first steps with these kinds of approaches for both risk detection and prevention. We still have a ton of work that we want to do, a lot of improvements that we have to make. And right now, our future and ongoing work is really focused on trying to do those things and make those improvements. But hopefully soon, this kind of work will actually start translating into changing this century or longer old trend of suicide death and suicide attempts and non-suicidal self-injury. Um, so thank you all for listening, and thanks very much to my colleagues who actually made all this work possible. Thank you, Dr. Franklin. Um, so we have a couple of questions from the audience, and we just have a, a couple minutes, so we'll ask a few of them. Um, there was one question about the machine learning study. Yes. Um, how did you guys choose the factors that you decided to finally include in the algorithm? What was your basis for choosing those? The um, short answer to that is that the algorithm essentially chooses them for us, and so we gave it 700 and something to choose from. And then it selected the ones that were significant, and then something called a, a cross-validation sample um, to see if it's significant in both samples. And if it is, then it, it wound up being included in the model. And so that's one area I didn't have time to explain, but basically the machine figures out the optimal algorithm and configuration for us. And was any kind of family history or anything like that included in those, or were they mainly medical records? That's a great question. Um, what we were really wanting to do with this initial effort here is create something that was going to be replicable across most systems. So at Vanderbilt, they have a whole bioinformatics group that does a lot of this great work and stuff like natural language processing that can get a lot more complicated, a lot of genetics work. But we wanted this to be something that in pretty much anyone's electronic health record and any system out there that you could just apply this to that. So it was just the, intentionally, just the very basic types of um, diagnoses and, and codes. Yeah, and um, have you, so it sounds like, um, I guess there was a question from the audience about the generalizability or the applicability mm -hmm. for BPD. Um, do you think that this, that your uh, treatment intervention, the therapeutic, um, the TEC, okay. do you think that that could be used with BPD or do you think that there might be issues with seeing images um, that might, maybe confound the effects you found? That's a good question. I think, um, so we didn't ask it in particular in this study, um, but I, I know just, and going back and forth with participants, that a lot of them said that they had been diagnosed 
with BPD, but certainly we caution far and wide for these kind of studies for what they're gonna see. And so we had people select in the study if they were already okay with seeing it. So it is unclear what happened, but I think that there are a bunch of ways to use these general types of conditioning principles to get around that for, for certain people. Well, thank you very much. Thank you all.